Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Two Wings Seminar, a production of the Holy Apostles Faculty. St. John Paul II, in Fidesit Ratio, said, Faith and reason are like two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of truth. In God has placed in the human heart a desire to know the truth, in a word, to know himself, so that by knowing and loving God, men and women may also come to the fullness of truth about themselves. I'm delighted to introduce today Dr. Michaela Ferry, a scholar in aesthetics and chair of the Bachelor of Arts program in Sacred Arts at Holy Apostles College and Seminary in Cromwell, Connecticut. And today we'll be dialoguing with Stefano Albertini Mussini, whom she'll introduce now. Welcome, Michaela. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you, Professor Albertini Mussini. And uh, uh, let me introduce uh, Professor Albertini, our host, uh, and I'm honored to have him uh, in this show. Thanks uh, to Dr. Sebastian Massoud. Uh, he accepted my idea for this uh, show, uh, dedicated to this uh, uh, great and particular exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, in New York City. Uh, Professor Albertini is a PhD in Stanford University, he is director of uh, Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimo at uh, NYU and a clinical professor of Italian literature and cinema at uh, NYU. He is um, studying also liturgy and then uh, Professor Albertini will explain us and uh, he is a Catholic of the parish of St. Joseph's in Greenwich Village in New York. Um, so honored and uh, mm, uh, what can I say? That this is a great theme, uh, a theme uh, discussed in many senses in these, in these days here in Italy. I have been trying to follow all the discussions around this uh, exhibition, and uh, as an expert and a scholar in uh, sacred art. I can uh, share with you my impressions, uh, my perspective. Uh, I will visit uh, the exhibition in the next month. Uh, I received uh, now the catalog uh, a couple of weeks ago. I received a kit press uh, from the press office uh, of MET, and uh, I have been studying uh, this uh, exhibition from a, uh, I, how can I say, a historical point of view. Uh, what I can say is that uh, uh, this great uh, exhibition uh, is uh, having a strong impact uh, in the Catholic world and outside the Catholic world, both for what concerns the theme, session uh, totally inspired by the Catholic worship and liturgical tradition, and a sort of silent message. Uh, it is the everyday challenge of Catholicism in a contemporary world which needs uh, to recover the uh, binding with a sphere of the sacred. And this is the anthropological side uh, of, uh, how can I say, of our argument. If the event uh, of the opening uh, of this, uh, uh, I can say, amazing exhibition, the Met Gala that took place on 7th of May 2018, was the declaration of a provocation, because it was indeed the exhibition, Heavenly Bodies, uh, Session and the Catholic Imagination, this is the title, um, is the unexpected artwork produced by a curiosity, in my opinion, great curiosity that led to rediscover the roots of a historical path showing how fashion and cinema, to, uh, in particular, have been attempting to use the elements of the Catholic tradition. The aim of the exhibition is to explore how the Catholic liturgical symbolism has impacted uh, and can create an impact on uh, contemporary haute couture and ready-to-wear fashion designs. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a part the particular side uh, of the event. Uh, remember that the exhibition hosts 
uh, selected objects from the Vatican collection that many of us uh, never saw, directly related to the sphere of the sacred that we um, tended in its profound religious sense. An important example is uh, the pair of shoes uh, whereby one of our beloved Holy Fathers, now Saint John Paul II, uh, remembered that uh, this exhibition is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City in a delicate moment of passage for the history of the Catholic Church, a moment still difficult to understand uh, by all of us uh, and uh, indicated by our willing to overcome past uh, here in specific uh, by the attempt uh, of a revision of the relationship with all what is the word of the visual art. And um, uh, let me now uh, start the dialogue with uh, Professor Albertini Mussini and uh, mm, I will uh, mm, present him uh, free for questions. And first of all, Professor Albertini, uh, do you want to introduce uh, with um, a consideration uh, of yours about this exhibition? Because you, you were there and you visited it, and uh, your eyes are precious for us uh, uh, as, uh, as you as a visitor. Thank you, Dr. Ferry. I feel a bit intimidated to talk about this exhibit, but you were really the expert of sacred art. Uh, but I, I hope our listeners will, will forgive me uh, if I provide probably a, a more personal reaction to the exhibit mm. and a reaction not necessarily of an expert, but of a common person, if you wish to add a Catholic, uh, who has been raised with love for the liturgy and for everything that makes liturgy, and especially the Roman liturgy, the liturgy of the Roman Church, so beautiful and still so appealing. So that would be, that's going to be my, my approach. Um, and um, yes, I had the fortune of visiting uh, the exhibit in a private viewing organized by the um, Consulate General of Italy in New York that collaborated with the Metropolitan in a variety of different practical aspects because it's, it was also a very complicated exhibit to realize in terms of insurances, as you can imagine, in yeah. transportation, and of course the, the relationship also with the Vatican, uh, because it's not a relation, it was not a relationship museum to museum in this case, because as, as you mentioned, there are some pieces that we have never seen before in the Metropolitan Museum exhibit, because they do not belong to the collection of the museums. They are part of the Sistine Chapel sacristy, that as you know, is the sacristy of the Holy Father. So these are, and it's the so-called living sacristies, the sacristy that still could be used now by the Pope, uh, should, we, should he wish so, to, um, for, for the celebrations of the Holy Father. So that's already, it's a very special occasion, because not even if you visit the Vatican, you will have a chance to see these pieces that are uh, inside the Metropolitan. To me, that was a great emotion to see many of these, of these manifests. Also thinking about the history, not only of art and craftsmanship, but also of faith that is behind them. And one of the things that uh, the Vatican negotiated, um, the several people that were involved at different levels uh, in the Vatican, was that these objects should be displayed in a completely separate space uh, from everything else that is featured in the exhibit. And as you know, the exhibit is, is uh, organized by the Costume Institute that we can say is the sort of fashion department of the Metropolitan Museum. Um, so the, the, most of the, the exhibit is um, dresses and clothes and accessories designed by contemporary fashion designers, the, the great names that we all have in mind and that come to mind when we talk about fashion. So I think that already was a very, very important uh, statement that these objects that have these function, sacred function in the liturgy, were uh, loaned by the Sistine Chapel sacristy, but they had to be displayed in a completely separate venue. Whereas all the, the creations of fashion designers were displayed at the Metropolitan Museum in the main body of the Metropolitan, in the medieval and Byzantine art gallery, along with the other objects that are already part of the collection of the museum. So they, they're still in a sort of a sacred context, but separated from the objects that were um, loaned by the Vatican. So that's already a, a, a first 
thing that it's important to say, you know, separating what is the object that inspired the art and the object that was inspired by, by those things. Yeah. Um, and I think that was a, a, moment, a moment of clarity. It would have been very, probably for the curators and for, especially for the designers of the exhibit would have been much more fun to put them together and mix them up. But I think in terms of uh, historical um, um, discourse and uh, scientific discourse, it makes much more sense that the two things are kept separate and that you establish the connection that is indeed there in your head through your imagination and through your frame of reference. Uh, and then there is, as you know, Michele, there is another section of the exhibit that is at the cloister, that is the medieval section of the, of the metropolitan uptown, uh, where there are other, other pieces that are more inspired to the monastic um, habits, the habits of, yeah, of monks and religious women. And uh, there is one section about the seven sacraments. It's a beautiful setup. And um, already that is a very, let's say, sacred arrangement because for those of you who have not been, the cloister is basically the reconstruction of monasteries and churches and chapels and other medieval buildings uh, yeah. in the north side of Manhattan. It's a beautiful museum, uh, and this is a great excuse to go back even for those of us who have been there already. So this is my, the general overview is that what you can expect when you enter this exhibit the objects on the Sistine Chapel that include, you know, tiaras and, and mitres and other liturgical objects. And, of course, the great part of this are the, um, the, the vestments, the pontifical vestments that being in the, in the Sistine Chapel are for the exclusive use of the, of the pontiffs, of the supreme pontiffs, of the popes. And, of course, they are the, some of the most beautiful things in the, in, in the genre that you can find worldwide. And there is uh, embroideries and jewelry and a variety of other craftsmanship that are at play in this in these object. So this is the, o this the overview, Michaela. But I don't know whether I, I gave an idea of, of a general overview of, of what people can expect to see. Oh, no, that's, uh, that's precious what you told, and uh, thank you, Professor Albertini. And uh, if I may ask uh, also, um, uh, which were those uh, aspects uh, that uh, more than uh, others uh, uh, were put in evidence, uh, in your opinion, and made you reflect uh, on a uh, particular theme, a uh, particular uh, I mean, uh, element, uh, something that uh, was uh, so strange or uh, deserve a particular mention for you in this uh, great exhibition? To me, it was seeing... Um, it was... It, first of all, I took this exhibit as an homage to the beauty of the Roman liturgy. That's first and foremost. The fact that the most prominent museum in the world decides to dedicate a whole exhibit that is going to be probably the most visited exhibit this year in New York to uh, the Roman liturgy and to the oh, yeah. objects that are used for the Roman liturgy, it's an extraordinary uh, tribute to the tradition of beauty that uh, the lit Roman liturgy carries with itself. Oh, it's and it's good. something probably of which we Catholics are not always aware. Uh, you know, we get used to things and we think that, yeah, it's normal, that it's, it is as it is. No, it's the result of, of research and of centuries of refinement and, uh, and improvements and changes and, uh, and traditions all combined. So to me, that's, I, I, I took it, first of all, as a, an homage to the beauty that is the inner quality of the Roman Catholic liturgy. And as we know, it, it was one of the great um, topics of, of uh, Pope Benedict, the Pope Emeritus, is how through beauty you can reach the divine. The redeeming value of beauty. And we have a liturgy that has beauty as one of its most important features. Yeah. And it's a beauty, of course, that we deem pleases God in, in its whole concept of liturgy, but it's also beauty that pleases the eye and the senses of the faithful. Because as we know, in the, in the Catholic liturgy, all the senses are involved, our eyes, our ears, the music, what we see happening on the altar, the smell, the incense, uh, 
so it's a, it's a global, it's a, it's a comprehensive exhibit. So first and foremost, that's what I perceived it. Uh, it's an homage to beauty in the Catholic liturgy. And not in Catholic art, in Christian art, because of course we, know, we are very familiar with the great masterpieces of paintings and sculpture that are part, of course, of, these, of this beauty. But this is specific in homage to the liturgy and to object, or liturgical objects. So it's a very, very specific uh, very, I mean, we would say it's a niche within uh, the, the more general discourse. And the original idea, I, I heard the, the curator of this exhibit, Mr. Bolton, that the idea was more ecumenical. In, and it started as the, the influence of religious vestments and objects in uh, contemporary fashion. And then when they started researching this topic, they realized, and Mr. Bolton before everybody else, that just dealing with the Catholic imagination would be more than enough for an exhibit. So not to ex exclude any other tradition, but they decided to concentrate on this one because it was already so rich and it provided so many stimuli and so many different um, perspectives that it would have been really um, not appropriate to include other religions because otherwise all of them would have had a very, very small place and it couldn't have been done in such a comprehensive and in-depth manner. Uh, my other impression, Michaela, was that I was ready for, uh, you know, the provocation because I went there after the, the, the Met Gala. I did not go to the dinner. It was a $33,000 yeah. a piece yeah. dinner that I could not what afford. I, I probably, even if I had, I would have spent it a different way. But, you know, it's what keeps the costume institute alive. They have to raise, unlike the other, if we can get into the integrated details, but it's important, I think, for people to know that unlike the other divisions of the metropolitan that have endowments and have uh, resources to keep up their operations, the costume institute is one of the most recent parts of the metropolitan, and it needs to raise its funds every year to survive. And the Met Gala that has become the most mundane and social uh, event of the year in New York is the major source of uh, okay. fundraising for the Costume Institute. So I believe there is something like $12 million. So good for that. I was not at the gala, but I saw some of the images of the gala. And some of the images were not exactly in tune with my liking. Let's say they were not my cup of tea. So it was, it was ready for more like provocative uh, sort of um, uh, a more provocative setup. So already when I realized the distinction, I was very pleased and it was very different from what I expected. And the gala has also that purpose. The gala is a fundraiser and it's also a way for um, getting the attention of the media. If you have an exhibit and you tell them beautiful things about you know, the treasures of the, of the papal sacristy and the symbology of all these things, not many newspapers are going to send their correspondents and their journalists to write about it. If you say Rihanna is going to wear a mitre of the mm. bishop, yeah. it's going to be in the newspaper the day after. So the gala serves this double purpose, and I think people should not be influenced by what they saw at the gala before they go see the exhibit. I stop here for now. <laughs> I understand. Oh, thank you so much, Professor Albertini. And uh, this is a, a special account, but that's particular to hear uh, from a, a testimony uh, of the event of the exhibition. And le let me add uh, just one question. And uh, this exhibition, and uh, of course, well, uh, there is a great difference, a particular difference between the event and the exhibition itself. Mm, do you think, uh, uh, Professor Albertini, that uh, something changed about the collective imagination on uh, the Catholic uh, world? And uh, in, uh, mm, uh, how can I say, in, if we can uh, mm, take this exhibition as a sign, as, a, as an event that can uh, make us reflect uh, on uh, the theme of relationship between uh, what is liturgy, fashion, and uh, uh, the Catholic world uh, that uh, we can uh, rediscover also thank, uh, thanks to this uh, exhibition. Because uh, I think that this exhibition uh, is not only a, 
a simple, um, uh, how can I say, an example of uh, the meeting uh, encounter between fashion and Catholic art, but also a sort of uh, event that can uh, um, enlighten our attention upon all what is the Catholic world. What do you think about this? Uh, you are uh, Catholic, uh, and so uh, you can, can you spend some words uh, about the meaning, in your opinion, the meaning of this uh, exhibition for the great public? I, I'll, I'll try. Um, it's very hard Thank for you. me to assess the impact that this might, uh, the impact that this exhibit might have on you know on the larger on the Catholic uh, audience at large. What I was pleased at is that despite that, before it started, there were concerns on the part of the Metropolitan that there would be protests, either from let's say for lack of better definitions, more conservative Catholics and for more progressive Catholics because. If you wish, that could, there was ground for both because more conservative Catholics could have objected to the fact that these um, objects were decontextualized and that it was a sort of a mockery, and of course, especially after the images of the gala arrived. And for more progressive Catholics, uh, it would have been considered an operation that sort of uh, put at the center these very lavish, the very um, luxurious sort of items with embroideries and a lot of gold and a lot of precious stones that would be sort of opposite to the uh, so-called church of the poor, the prefer preferable option for the poor. And I'm very glad that there weren't, at least there weren't major uh, protests on either side, because I think that would have really hijacked the, the meaning of, of this exhibit. And it really was not relevant to what the main purpose of this exhibit is. Now, what is the impact that that is going to have on, on Catholics? I think that on a very simple level, it could be a way for all Catholics to, that go see the exhibit to rethink about the concept that I was trying to express before, how beautiful the Roman Catholic literature is, and to find the this element of beauty, even in their daily or you know every Sunday uh, experience at the Mass, find that beauty and try to do whatever they can to make it even more beautiful. Um, so this, I would think, on a very simple base, would be these objects that might have become familiar to you, the vestments uh, and the liturgical objects, um, they have a beauty. They have such a beauty that have been imitated by others for the production of other things, like clothes or dresses. Um, so I would say that, that is, and maybe, and maybe this is a wishful thinking, also to create a more educated aesthetic sensitivity. I think that not all the things that are used in the liturgy, not all the vestments and not all the objects that are used in the liturgy today are worthy of that great tradition. And I'm not saying that things should be done imitating what was done in the past, but the idea is that um, what these objects uh, witness are that at a time you would use for the worship of God the best that you could offer. And if gold was the best that you could offer, you would use gold. And if yeah. precious embroidery, you would use precious embroidery. This doesn't mean that we need to do uh, golden embroidered uh, tunics or um, copes now. We, we can use what, we, what our society and our culture deems as precious and beautiful today for the cult, for the worship of God. So I would say these are the two major things that I, I believe could help Catholics and could offer stimuli to Catholics. First, recognize the beauty that is already in there and rediscover it. And the other one, think of how, as, as a Christian, as a Catholic, you have a duty to keep the beauty alive today with what we have today. So it's not a nostalgic operation, but it's an operation of, of education and learning. Thank you so much for these reflections, and uh, I read with great interest, uh, Professor Albertini, your article published uh, in a journal, La Voce di New York, uh, New York Voice, and that's uh, uh, amazing that you recalled uh, the 
element of the nostalgia, nostalgia. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And uh, I perfectly agree with you. Let me add one consideration because I had in my mind some images first, uh, because of course the dim is uh, deeply interesting, but it's difficult to receive from the larger public. And uh, if I reflect, for example, on the gold, uh, the color that uh, recalls the divinity, uh, not only nowadays, uh, but from the antiquity. It's uh, expensive. Yeah, of course. Uh, and human fasc fascination with gold uh, is uh, old as the history itself. Uh, we don't know for sure when the first human picked up a gold uh, nugget and thought, uh, that's precious, that's pretty cool. However, uh, flakes of gold uh, have been found in Paleolithic caves uh, dating back, uh, I think, uh, 40,000 before Christ. If I think, for example, to the purple, uh, I can say in Italian, porpora, uh, the first um, translation I have in my mind is purple, uh, is the color of the splendor and the most celebrated wealth in antiquity, not, not only today. In ancient Rome, purple was the color of royalty, uh, indicating yeah. a status. Uh, was expensive because uh, it, come, it came from snails. And uh, after the image I have in my mind, uh, Giotto's bell tower uh, was the most expensive building in Florence. Uh, you are in Florence now. You can, you can. I see it in, from uh, my very window now, actually. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great, yes. and that's uh, an image that uh, that is uh, precious for this case. But uh, if it were not there, what would Florence be like without uh, Giotto's bell tower? Yeah. yeah. And and the same for other examples of our Italian cities and uh, in other cities of the Western world. But we, can, we, we have sample source also in the Eastern world. Even if I can recall an image from, the, from our sacred history, even the pound of parfum with which our Saint Mother Mary anointed the feet of Jesus in the dinner of Bethany was not cheap. And uh, the usefulness of this perfume could be discussed, but uh, it was used, and uh, we have uh, this uh, history from our Gospels. Uh, we have on our shoulders uh, this great history of the Church, uh, which is the history of art, and I perfectly agree with you. Uh, we have uh, also opposite uh, movements inside uh, our history. St. Francis' poverty against the luxury of the church of his time, or uh, uh, thinking about architecture, the Romanesque, that is the opposite, uh, for example, to the Baroque. I mean, this exhibition's aim is really to present a different kind of beauty. Uh, certainly, the theme of the fashion recalls uh, uh, all what is unuseful, all what is opposite of the poverty, all what is far from our need as persons of faith. Yes, of course, because fashion is uh, fashion is mundane, is uh, all what is uh, totally the opposite of uh, theology. But uh, the art entered the whole thing history of the dress code of the church. In this case, it seems to me that uh, the fashion. Uh, and uh, I agree with you, wants to be inspired by the art of the Catholic Church. It seems to me that the fashion wanted to experiment itself also in this part of the history. And uh, all what I can say from my side, for what concerns the Met Gala that took place on 7th of May 2018, is that... Uh, well, the respect in front of the sacrality of the dim is needed, but uh, uh, the exhibition is totally different from the, the event of the Met Gala. I have uh, uh, I read uh, the, the message uh, delivered by Cardinal Timothy Dolan at the Met Gala, and uh, he concluded uh, with uh, the words, uh, in the Catholic imagination, the truth, the goodness, and the beauty of God is reflected all over even in fashion, he said, the word is a shot through with his glory. And he concluded by saying thanks to the Vatican for its historic operation. 
I'm honored to be here. Of course, uh, it was a, a sort of shock, but uh, um, I think that now the times uh, are ready for this kind of event, for this kind of uh, uh, groundbreaking uh, event and exhibition. And thanks, uh, Professor Albertini, for uh, your reflections uh, and uh, for your opinion for being uh, in this show. Uh, the first uh, Italian, of course, I, I know many uh, priests and nuns and they're working in the field of sacred art, but uh, I thought about you because you were there as a testimony and because uh, I think that uh, an expert of Italian culture in uh, United States, uh, director of the Casa Italiana di Rili Marimo, even because uh, I, I associate all what is uh, uh, Italian with all what is Vatican, but I think in, in New York <laughs> they, they, they do yeah. it too every day. So Vatican is like to say right, Italian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, it's also because the reason I was there for this preview is that the Italian consulate really actively participated in, in, oh, in the organization of the exhibit and provided its help. So it's, it's, it's very true. I imagine. I imagine. So that's, uh, that's great. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Albertini. Uh, I ask you if uh, you have something to add, of course, uh, some reflection, a uh, thought, a particular thought. Uh, uh, or uh, if for you is, uh, is uh, we can close uh, and just the show. Add a couple of, of, of flash so people maybe when they visit they can concentrate on things that I particularly like. But first of all, okay. you're totally right, Michele Beatrice. We we should not be scandalized even by the Met Gala. I mean, there is a there was a playful dimension dimension to it. Oh. And one of the priests that raised me used to say, yeah. liturgy has a ludic dimension to it. It is. It's also there is a part of it that is plain, you know, and it's, it has to be playful and joyful. If it's done with good taste, everything is fine. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that you, you, you talked on Passan about the reference to cinema, and they very smartly decided to put a screen with in loop that beautiful um, clip from uh, Federico Fellini's Roma, and it's the yeah. defile yeah, of a fashion show. And that, that runs in a loop in one, of, in, one of, in, one of the, in one of the rooms. And then one piece that I haven't gotten much attention because it's neither a sacred vestment uh, loaned from the Vatican nor designed by a fashion designer, but it's a beautiful chasuble uh, by Henri Matisse. And it's part of the collection of vestments that he prepared for the Chapel of the Holy Rosary in Vans in the south of France. Uh, that he designed, uh, and it's a beautiful story uh, that might, maybe your listeners like to hear. He was convalescent, and he needed a nurse, and he put an ad on the paper, and this young woman replied, and she took care of him. He healed and was feeling better, and then after a few years, he received a letter from this uh, young girl that has become a Dominican nun, a cloister nun, and she sends him okay. some uh, drawings for a chapel, and because the, the, her community has decided to build this chapel in Vance. And he says, okay, instead of correcting your drawings, I'm going to draw the whole thing for you. So he designed this beautiful chapel with internal decorations and all the vestments. And one of these vestments is in the, at the Metropolitan, and many other of these pieces are in the uh, Vatican Museum, in the Contemporary Art Collection. So that is also a very... And it, you probably won't notice it because it's a sort of on a stairway going from the ground floor to the underground floor. But do look at it because I think that's a great proof of how beauty can still be incorporated in the Catholic liturgy using the, the means, the craftsmanship, and the taste of the people of today to produce something that is beautiful and sublime in a way that is oh, yeah. probably more understandable by contemporary. So take a look at the, at the Matisse Chasuble when you, when you pass by, and, and I think that's probably a great link between the two different floors. Oh, thank you. That's, that's very interesting. And uh, together with the connection with the cinema, because uh, I, I, I thought about the connection with the history of our cinema, and what you said that's greatly interesting. I take the occasion to, to add just one thing. I, I just 
um, remember that uh, this here is uh, 80 here of the opening of the mass cloisters that uh, opened on the public on uh, May 10, 1938. And uh, uh, this exhibition, in my opinion, um, it, the aim is also to uh, have the Met Cloisters uh, at the attention of the great public, uh, not only as, uh, of course, uh, plays one of the parts of the great Metropolitan Museum, but uh, uh, also with this connection with all what is uh, medieval art and uh, the connection with the history of the church, because the history of art is the history of the church indeed, so we, we can't forget it. And thank you so much for this precious insight, Professor Albertini. And, uh, thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking to you. you. Grazie. Uh, Professor thank Albertini you. is calling from Florence, and now uh, we ask him to, to, see for, to say hello for us uh, to the Giotto's Bell Tower. Uh, in this moment, I will. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Professor yes. Albertini. And, uh, thank you very I'm much for having forward. me. Thank you, thank you. Looking forward to dialoguing again with you, to talking again with you. And a great person, a great scholar. Thank you again. And uh, thanks to Dr. Sebastian Mafut for hosting this uh, precious show. Thank you so much. And uh, have a great day. And uh, let me conclude by um, adding that today uh, we remember St. Louis uh, Gonzaga, Jesuit patron of the Yauf. He was born in uh, 1568. He died in 1591. That's uh, precious data, and uh, I, uh, I hope that uh, he will inspire uh, young people uh, in the uh, United States, uh, in Italy, and uh, let's inspire also us uh, in our research, in our work for young people. Thank you again to everybody. Thank you, and bye-bye. Uh, See you in the next uh, show. Bye. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.